My name is Sean Ronaldo. I'm going to be the moderator for this next panel, which is called Putting the Art in Artist, Finding and Maintaining Your Artistic Voice. And what we're going to be chatting about today is basically how artists in today's like crazy world where there's so many responsibilities of social media and promoting yourself and thinking about your career and everything is industry focused. How do people actually still find the time to focus on music and records and what this is all about and why we're all here. So we have a very esteemed panel and I'm just gonna go ahead and introduce everyone. We have Dasha Rush, Josie Rebell, DVS1, and DJ Stingray. So to kick off the conversation today, I thought I would ask everyone, I mean, all of you, either DJ or perform music live or make music yourselves. But what are some of the other things that you've found that you're expected to do as an artist or that you have to do as an artist besides making music? And how has that changed over time? Because all of you have been in this game for a while. So whoever wants to take it. I mean, I could go on for hours, but you know, I mentioned it earlier on, even in the in the no photo panel that we did, and I said that we're pressured into this responsibility to be also good at marketing and to also be good at uh, Facebook and Instagram and everything else. And how can anyone expect us to be good at music when we spend all this other time having expectation of running the rat race and keeping up with everybody else? And it's almost like an expectation of competition versus creativity. So I guess my simple answer is just all these expectations to compete, get likes, numbers, reputation builds, and all these things that actually have zero to do with the quality and content of our artistic integrity. Um, I'd say for me, I'm, I hate like being told what to do. So I'm like really bad. I like deleted my Instagram like last year, because I just, I just had enough of it. I haven't got a Facebook page. I have got one, but it's a personal one. So I'll post a flyer and underneath it's like my auntie in St. Lucia going, oh, bless you. <laughs> don't forget, don't forget to take your vitamins. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I'm quite active on Twitter. I like Twitter, but I think I like it for different reasons. I like it because I follow a lot of news outlets. It's knowing what's going on in the world. I also think in terms of music, I think maybe I'm following maybe a bit too many DJs. Sometimes it feels like every, like literally Twitter is literally just DJ sometimes and Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> but it's, um, I do like it because I think there's a lot of movements happening where you can see those being born out there. Um, but I think for me, I, I, res I do resist it quite hard. I, I'll post, I'll post fly. I don't, I mean, I don't even post kind of every flyer, but I'll post things that's, that's happening. But I think the expectation that you have to be doing all of this stuff is something that is um, makes me feel like really, really uncomfortable. And I don't like to do it for the sake of it. And I think because I spent most of my life working in a corporate environment, I think the idea of then translating all of those things, marketing and trying to climb up a ladder to music, which is something that I find so personal and like so fun and has always been something that has been like a beautiful, precious thing that I've done on the side for the majority of my career, then to kind of be doing this full time and the expectation being that you treat this in the same way that you treat a corporate job is something that I'm like, I would rather just kind of go back to the corporate job and, and do this as a hobby again. So I, but I definitely do see that the expectations there. And I think with DJing, I think there's an expectation that you have to do all these things. You have to be ticking a certain box. You have to have a certain personality. I even hear horror stories about agents and managers telling artists what kind of things they should be wearing to DJ out and like, what, how they should be presenting themselves, what their personal brand should be, things that are really alien to them. And it's almost like you're expected that you should do it because that's like the, the kind of base level of it. And actually, do you need to do it? When I deleted my Instagram, people were like, you deleted your Instagram. It's like the reaction was almost like I turned off my own life support machine. Yeah. That's like people, that's how people were going on. And it was like, it made no difference whatsoever. It's Instagram, it's a website. If it crashes tomorrow, everyone's content's going to be gone. We don't own it. We don't own it. That They own us. So I just think I can see the expectation is there. But I think if people are scared to, to resist it, you shouldn't be because what's the worst that could happen, you know? 
I'd love to hear from Stingray about this. I mean, especially, I mean, you're wearing a mask here. So I don't think you really engage too much with the whole social media world, do you? Well, with me, you know, it's like, I figure, you know, you got Colt, Pepsi, Paris Hilton, all these people putting stuff out into the airwaves. And I figure, well, why not put our content out there and give people an alternative somewhere to a, a person they can follow, look up to, you know, um, why leave it to the big corporate guys? Why leave it to the, you know, to the uh, the knuckleheads? You know what I mean? So me, I figure it's a, it's a vehicle for us to uh, put our views and our music out here and make a dent in the world instead of being, you know, just passive observers. So I think it's more about, you know, like, you know, Josie mentioned, you don't let the, you know, you don't let your manager or whoever tell you what to put out. You, you decide that for yourself. And I say be assertive. Put your content out there and and, and make a difference. And let's 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 not be uh, passive observers. That's that's about what I have to say on that. Dasha, you've been doing this a long time. Do you feel like the demands on you have changed over time in terms of what you're expected to do besides just making music and playing shows? Well, I don't know what that demands. <laughs> you know, I just know what my internal demands are for whatever creative process, but. Uh, I want to come back to that subject of Instagram and social media for a second, where actually I agree with uh, with Sherard that um, you know you it just takes your own discipline how much you know it's nothing wrong to share the content it's just the time you spend on and I think it's actually good you know it can be positive you communicate your own content you communicate your own process and the people who are interested they <coughs> sorry I'm a bit sick uh, they follow you but you know it's like it's just you know, you have to find a way not to be dependent on the image on that, you know, like surface and, you know, actually still have time to do actual music and stuff. And I mean, we all know the problem, you know, but, uh, you know, it's like, I think it's just sort of a self-discipline for the artist in a, that kind of environment now. So it's, it's a lot of work, well, but I said, think it's, it's possible. Yeah. It's controlling your content yeah, and exactly. choosing your content. And, and I think the relevance of your content to your vision, your mission, your creativity, and not following any hype of yeah. necessity of, like I said, yeah. the competition of what everyone else is doing. Yeah. This is your platform, my platform, her yeah. platform, yours. And we choose what we put out and the imagery that we put out or the aesthetic that we put out. And we're not following anything and any guideline. And I think yeah. that's yeah. why hopefully and we're all here. there shouldn't be no standards what to put and how to, but somehow it's just generally created <laughs> by itself anyway. But you know. Yep. One thing I wanted to ask you guys about is, you know, a few of you mentioned management, booking agents. I mean, more and more, these are considered like essential things that, that an artist needs. You know, not everyone has a manager, almost everyone you know, once you get to a certain level, you have a booking agent. How do you, you know, and even just interacting with these people, even if they're helping you, it's time, it's someone else's opinion about what you should or should not be doing. How do you find help, first of all? How do you decide what level of involvement they should have in your career? And how do you fit that into actually like being an artist at the same time? Whoever wants to take it. Well, you know, I mean, I don't want to like, but I just said, Sim, I have the best agent in the world because... I have one too. We share the same <laughs> share one. the same <laughs> best agent. But, you know, it's not about like agent business because there is a, also a human connection where we understand each other and where we can actually speak openly uh, towards, you know, ideas, goals and share. And it's not like... Uh, we kind of we're talking about probably business but it's not the product that we sell we also have that human i think we're seen yeah. as individuals by yeah. our agent by the people yeah. we work with instead yeah. of sold and seen as a product yeah. and i think a lot of new artists that are coming up especially if they've reached really quick status are yeah. sold and talked about as products, products yeah. and i think that's really negative to them even if maybe they could grow into real artists they're already being sold as products yeah. so i think like in our case and i don't know about you guys but i have a feeling that's a similar answer the people we work with closely they treat us as individuals they hear us of course their job is to sometimes disagree with us and tell us you know hey i think you should do this but in the end they respect that if we say no they will back us in the end we're on the same team and I think that's important to find the people who support you, who understand you, who will take the time to get to know you and your yep. 
needs, issues, and again, visions. Yeah, with who you actually have real human connection and understanding. Yeah. It's not just like, okay, let's make some money. You know, there is something yeah. to build behind that, behind the business. There's something to build, whatever. Yeah. And this friendship, artistic path, and something, something. Yeah. What about Josie or, or Stingray? Um, I think, yeah, I agree with all of that. And I think with uh, my agent as well, it's just someone that gets you as well. And I think especially if you, I'd, I'd class myself as an introvert and um, I don't really put myself out there in a kind of big way in terms of a brand. I don't have any brand. I don't have any kind of like record label. I don't have my, I've never really put on my own parties. I've had residencies and I don't have like management. I don't have PR. So I don't really have a brand, so to speak. And I think when you're an introvert on top of that, finding someone that you can work with that gets you is so important because you can get on with doing what you need to do. And then they can get on with having those conversations, especially things that you don't want to talk about like money and things like that. They can, they've got your best interests at heart and they can really sell isn't the right word because yes you're not a product but they're the ones that can kind of if they get you they can push you to the right people and they can they can bring in things that are exciting and interesting for you and I think yeah I think I'm really really lucky with my agent as well I mean maybe I've got the best agent in the world but um <laughs> we all have find the right person to connect yeah totally <laughs> you can see yourself, you can see yourself, you know, going for a long term, you know, it's just something, yeah, connect, connection. Stingray, do you also have the best agent in the world? Uh, yeah, you know, but, <laughs> you know, this was after, you know, going through several agents, you know what I mean, that I found out that I had a good agent. And the thing about it, uh, similar, it's, it's about having uh, somebody who understands you as a person, you share a similar vision, you're going to clash, that happens, but can you work out these uh, clashes in a civil, mature, respectful manner and go on about, you know, what your vision is as an artist? So yeah, I got a good artist, I mean, a good uh, agent and, uh, you know, I'm happy with her and uh, I, you know, I don't know what I would do without a solid agent or person in my corner to help me. All right. Well, aside from the agent stuff and the business stuff, I do want to ask you all about making music because you're all busy, like you're all, t you know, playing shows, touring, those kinds of things. I know it can be hard just to find time to get into the studio or to, you know, try practice DJing at home or, you know, pick music for the radio show. Like, how do you find time in your schedules to focus on music? Is it something you have to schedule? Is it just part of your daily routine? I'd really just love to know how you manage to fit it in. You just don't sleep, you know, sleep. <laughs> I mean, I, th I, like I, think, I think when you love what you do, I think when you genuinely love what you do, of course there's going to be times where it's too much and it's overwhelming and you just can't hear another thump and you can't hear another 909 or another beat and you can't go to the club. But I think when you love what you do, the moment you, your head is clear, that's the first place you, you get drawn to is to, if I'm not searching for music, I'm writing music. If I'm not writing music, I'm editing music. If I'm not editing music, um, you know, digging around for an old record and ripping it. There's always something I'm doing revolved around my love and I'm, I'm lucky. We're all lucky that we get to do music as a as a full time and 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 make a living on this. But I think when you love, like somebody asked me the other day, they're like, "How can you DJ twelve hours?" I was like, "When you love something, why couldn't you do it for twelve hours?" You know, I mean, it's it's tough, but it's we love it. I mean, and so you find time. I mean, I wish I was more productive in the studio. But DJing is my first love. I've made that really clear over the years. So I spend my time looking for records and editing records and finding abilities to enhance my DJ sets. But I find myself wishing I had some more time. I know Dasha is loves the studio, you know, and as much as she loves DJing and touring, I think she loves the studio 10 times more, you know, so in a good way. And so she's more productive in the studio than, let's say, somebody like me. Not really true, because yeah, that's well, the problem. Yeah. It's actually true it's hard to find time for the studio sometimes because just you know the physicality of that work you know you, it seems like it's all fun always and, and but actually i need two or three days to recover from the gig well it's it's the way and then you know the moment i go to the studio i have to go again so 
it's also the same I'm talking to myself how do I put this self-discipline where I actually have more time in the studio but then I'm also because I'm it's my work so I depend financially on it so I can't just you know not tour for one year because then I have to pay my bills so it's like it's it's a complex system but you know like you everybody has to find their own but it's hard it's actually not easy well it's not hard but it's isn't easy what about the other panelists uh yeah for me i i have um uh, apps on my my tablet so you know i have i do i'm always doing little sketches on the road on the plane in the lounge in the hotel room so i'm always working on little sketches and then i take them back to my work workstation and then translate them that way i haven't released anything in several years though in about three years since i started touring and um i, I man i can't lie it's it's really it's not the same as when i wasn't touring so much and i had the time to focus and and but now man you know my hard drive is full of like 12 or 13 different versions of the same song you know what i mean or it's full of half completed ideas and you know much less productive now now that i'm touring and so you know i'm still kind of trying to find a way to sit down behind the workstation and, and just write an ep or whatever right now it looks i mean it looks like a huge mountain to climb but you know thankfully i've got little bits and pieces and sketches when i finally do you know decide okay let's do it I've got something to work with and I'm not trying to create out of thin air. So I've, I have a little help, you know, so to speak. Um, I mean, I, I don't make any music, so I can't even, I can't even come up here and be like, oh, it's so hard. <laughs> so I literally. You're digging for music. I mean, I'm digging for music, but I, I actually feel embarrassed to tell people I'm a DJ sometimes. Cause I'm like, they're like, what do you do? And I'm like, I just play music. <laughs> for a living and they're like oh sick and you make tunes and you're like no and you're like oh you do this and you're like no i literally just buy tunes and play them and it's like to me i, I mean i don't i'm not saying that in a way that's like putting down djing because i come from a family of like djs everyone in my everyone in my family has been a dj even if they haven't been playing out a lot my family in st lucia I've got sound systems. There is, my, my uncle's been DJing for about 50 years and he's passed it down to his sons. And I'm just, I've been surrounded by music my whole life. And I would say some of the best DJs I've known in my whole life are just family members who have just got a selection that is just absolutely mind blowing. And I think I agree with the fact that um, the, the point that you made about when you love something, I mean, I just love it so much. And it's actually not just because I just love playing music. There's something about, the reason that I start that I wanted to DJ out more and more was I just love these tunes so much. I just want to hear them out loud. Like I just want to hear them out loud so badly. I don't even care if no one's there. I don't even look up when I'm DJing half the time. If the whole crowd walked out, I wouldn't even notice because I just want to hear these tunes out loud so badly. And I think going out digging, I still get that feeling of when you, you go up to a record shop or even just going through digital stuff and you f you're listening to loads of stuff that's not really for you. Some of it might be good, but it's just not your vibe. And then you just find something that just speaks to you. It just like hits you there. That feeling never, ever, ever dies. Like it's just, it's just too much. I'll be in the record shop literally like on my knees, like, oh my God, this tune is like, <laughs> like so incredible. And I think that that feeling is the thing that carries me. And I think um, because I don't produce, um, I've, I'm, I'm not in the same boat as as the others on the, on this panel, and I can definitely see that. And I think I can see with producers um, that I've that I've worked with in the past that as soon as the the kind of industry changed and and then they had to focus on to DJing, I definitely you could definitely see that their kind of production kind of credit started to go down. And I think a lot of people I know haven't been happy about that and actually haven't made music for many many years because actually they've had to make the transition transition from producer to dj as a result of the industry they were making a living an incredible living out of producing music and then almost overnight that's just disappeared and they've had to completely change career and from djing as, as you said from djing that's just taken a lot of their energy away and the space for them to be able to create 
Well, speaking of the word career, I think uh, a lot of artists these days seem to be very preoccupied with thinking about their work as a career. And even when, if they're in the studio or if they're getting ready to play a gig, they're thinking about, you know, not just like, what's the best music that I can play or make in this moment. They're thinking about, oh, I need to make this kind of record because I need this kind of review or this kind of booking, or I know this person, this festival booker's here and I want them to see me, so they book me. So I'm wondering for all of you, I mean, I feel like none, maybe not, but I feel like none of you necessarily fall into this category, but how do you manage to keep that kind of careerist thinking or worrying outside of your personal music space? I mean, you, you can't you can't fake who you are, plain and simple. You, you can bullshit a little bit, but at some point, the real you shows itself. And so I think a lot of people who are up there chasing, by my personal opinion, the wrong thing, it becomes obvious after a while. It just really does. And maybe, maybe I'm wrong, and maybe it's just obvious to a few of us and not everyone, but I think it starts to show itself. And I just think those, when you do something that you love, and I've said this so many times, you know, it's... Um, it's not that it's easy, it's hard, but it's easy to do it. And it's easy to see it in a different light. And I think even the nights when I think I don't want to hear anything anymore, like you said, I turn it up in the monitors and I feel that energy on my leg hit me. And I'm like, nah, I love it, you know, and I'm good. And, and then being genuine about it to myself even, and being able to share with my agent, I don't want to play there anymore. I didn't get a good feeling from that. And then, you know what? I really want to go play there as much as possible because it gives me something and I think, um, again, we're in this weird, being DJs is a really weird career. It's like the greatest and weirdest career ever because we get to do what we love. We also get to give feedback to the people we work with and try to fine tune that process and get it to where we're riding, you know, this not really wave, but we're riding something that we love, that we give to, and the amount that you give to it, the amount that you love it, it gives back to you, absolutely. And so then it becomes less of a career and it becomes more of like, um, I don't know, a mechanic, like we're, it's like a mechanic tuning a car. We're fine tuning everything constantly and it runs really well. Sometimes we're haggard and we're running a little low, but it's not, it is a job, but it's not a job. I think if you, we don't, I don't, I'm not treating mine like a job. I take it seriously, but I don't treat it like a job. Josie, I imagine you weren't like plotting a, you know, fantastic career when you were just doing your rinse FM show initially, and then it's, you know, blossomed into this whole thing, but has, uh, has your outlook in terms of how you approach music changed at all? Like, do you, have you started having any thoughts about like, Oh, I need to think more about my future or my career. I think, um, well, I, I was, I, I think I was, I was definitely a club DJ before the radio. So even the radio was like a big step for me because I'm, I'm very like head down, like introverted DJ and radio was actually for me. I was like, wow. I mean, it sounds weird to say and a lot of people like when I say that I'm an introvert DJ and they're like, but you stand in front of people and you play in front of them. It's it, the, I think that's to me the kind of the thing about DJing that I think is like quite an interesting thing because for me, when I DJ, I feel like it's such a personal thing and I, I think what I like about kind of the, the life that uh, being able to DJ full time has given me is that I'm able to spend a lot of time alone I love traveling I know some people don't like that I love traveling I'm getting to like I'm reading a lot I'm studying again and I'm I'm using all that time that on, on things that are in pursuit of things that I truly truly love and I think that's always been my my aim and I'm an ambitious person, but not in a sense of trying to climb any ladder. And I've been like that in my corporate life as well. I'm ambitious in the sense I just want to be as good as I can. And I think that's always been the only goal. I've never had like any plan. I mean, I don't even know what day it is right now. Do you know what I mean? So it's like... It's Friday. <laughs> is it? Sick. Um, but yeah, it's just like... <laughs> It's like I, I, I've never been able to, I'm not the kind of person that plans. I mean, to be honest, if you ever see me 
like with a bit of paper on my in my hand and it's like here's my like three-year plan just be just take it out of my hand and just rip it up because it's going to go wrong like immediately as soon as I st- try to like put any structure to these things it it doesn't work well because for me it has to be on instinct it has to come out of here and I just follow my instincts and I think if you can spend your life just trying to do the things that you love and just trust your instincts, then those things get stronger and stronger as you go by and then you can just kind of keep trusting them. Also, the other thing though is if I got to a position where I felt like I had to start making decisions in DJing in order to stay DJing, I would rather quit DJing and go back to a day like my day job 100% or do a mixture of the both like. And I think that's having worked full time for so much of my career has been the thing that's enabled me to get this to this place because it was easy for me to say no I don't want to do this because I didn't have to do it. I didn't have to do things for money and I I had more of I was able to take a back seat to the whole thing not a back seat I was able to kind of look at it in a different way and be like actually I don't want to do this this and this I just want to do things that make me feel good like you said yeah. and actually that I think that is a benefit of working that people don't often game. talk about as well yeah. and when people are always thinking like that the gate the end like the, the end goal might be to like quit your day job and I I think that's something to think about actually the benefit of having a day job when when you're DJing as well not just the financial security but actually just how it affects your whole kind of viewpoint of life and I definitely think that it helped me. Stingray I know like for many years I mean you've been doing this for a long time but for many years you were just kind of you know doing your thing in Detroit traveling a bit but mostly just doing your thing in Detroit heads knew what was up but in the last few years that's really changed so how has your artistic mentality changed between all those years that you were just kind of head down in Detroit doing your thing and now that you're like traveling all over the world? Um, I feel like I have more options now. And then I feel like I have more of a duty to be true to what I'm doing. You know, now I don't have to, I don't have to do what, you know, I don't have to do the Instagram thing. I don't, I don't have to do it. I don't have to wear certain clothes. You know, I can be myself. So I think I, you know, uh, I'm in a position to be free. So my artistic vision, I feel like has grown now. And I just want to take my sound from the past. Excuse me. I listen to some of the stuff from the past that I've done and I'm absolutely horrified and I want to just I want to just go take my sound to another level. I just want to purify it. And, you know, that's where I'm at artistically now. I just want to take what I've been doing and go, you know, point five, point seven, you know, point nine. You know what I mean? Just just keep going. DJ wise and uh, production wise. Dasha, what about you? Right now is the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, like that's what actually triggers me the most to, talking about the artistic integrity. You know, regardless of the career, you can build, you know, you can think about <coughs> building career, but actually, uh, for me, the artistic integrity and you know the fact uh, you the, the your artistic process is not something that you think oh i want to build that career or i want to go that way actually you have to st- well for me you have to start thinking what do you want to talk about really like wh- when you yourself what what's what are your interests what you want to transmit so can i bring the chair yeah go <laughs> yeah for it. i have a we little have a bit proper i'll try so <laughs> <laughs> For me, the the art, well, the artistic approach, the art has no uh, direct functionality. So, which is, you know, it has no function, you know, like practical purpose. So, what I mean by that is that um, you don't make record to actually get gigs. I mean, some people do, but the record, the purpose of a record or the purpose of a, uh, let's say, artistic, um, you know, uh, expression is actually because you want to talk about something, you want to express something, rather it's the world, rather it's, I don't know, whatever your personal story, rather your pain, your happiness, something. So the functionality, if you build a chair and, you know, it can be beautiful, it can be artistic, but it has a purpose, you sit on it, right? Is It has a, um, how to say, defined function, yeah. but then Unfortunately, I can't break the leg of the chair. So imagine one of the leg is broken. So the chair, well, I don't know how to show it. It's not in a space. The chair has only three legs. And that is your work. I mean, I'm talking about metaphorically. Yeah, This is your artistic work. So 
what you try to express is not that you know this is the chair it's like you sit on it as a functional thing and everybody understand and it's practical and people will respect you but actually there is something you want to express and everybody will interpret it whatever they interpret their own way but what i want to express was a chair of three legs maybe instability maybe fragile um, path of mind <coughs> so it's really hard for me to speak because i'm a bit sick but um so what I'm saying with all this, I'm trying, what I'm trying to say with all this is that I think it shouldn't have this um, functional idea of something that, oh, if I release the record, I'll get something from it. No, it's I release the record because I want to say something and I want to talk about something, whatever, it doesn't matter what it is. <coughs> and for me, it's, I think, where where is the starting point and it's actually you search within you not with the industry or you know planning oh i release that then this person will like me or book me or something like this and that's where you can kind of the way you keep your artistic yeah. integrity somehow yeah. i don't know if i was <laughs> no it makes sense yeah i tried <laughs> i mean yeah. but that's the same thing like i would say for even all of us up here i mean i know a little bit about everyone's backstory and i think we all did this I don't think any of us really did this trying to be something like we were saying, like to release There's the no record. To be, I didn't try to be a DJ to have this be my job or to travel the world or to play cool gigs. I got into this somehow. Luckily, I found this in my life and it was it, it grabbed me. It, it took me. This community took me. The music took me and I got good at it somehow by doing it for years without any purpose other than expression yeah, exactly. expressing my emotion my feeling i wanting to share it with people yeah. my sonics whatever it might be and i'm 43 now my explosion didn't happen until i was 33 34. you're traveling the world now you know in in your later part of your life for all of us like you said you had a corporate job the gigs had the money from music had nothing to do with your interest in music, which allowed you the freedom to make choices in music with no pressure of money. And I think that's really important for all of us up here that we've done. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go back to your three legged chair analogy here, because and this is for everybody. Like, let's say, you know, you make the three legged chair in the studio. You're really excited about it. And then it comes out and the three-legged chair gets a bad review. Or someone on Facebook writes, I hate that three-legged chair. I wish she would go back to making the four-legged chair that she made two years ago. Yeah, how, <laughs> how do all of you deal with that when you try something, you're passionate about it, and it doesn't get the response you want? And you might be worried that that response might affect your ability to keep making three-legged chairs. I think a part of us, you have to shut everyone out. You have to believe in what you do enough. And I mean, I, I've, I, it's even like on another flip of that, I've watched reviews or paid too much attention to RA at some point when I started my, my career or read too much in the magazines and I would read something about a record that everyone was playing and I'd listen to it and be like, I don't like that record. And I'd wonder, is it me or is it everyone else? Or do I have this pressure? Should I play it? Do I need to like it? Why don't I understand it? And I would start questioning myself. The moment I, and this is why I'm also, I'm happy that in myself, my career happened later in my life because I know what I want. I know my taste. I'm confident in those things. And so when I hear something, if I don't like it, I don't like it. I don't care if everyone else does. And if somebody wants to say something negative about a record I put out, a set I played, of course I'm human. And I can't get past it. But so being smart and protecting myself as a human by getting rid of Instagram. I have an Instagram account. I've never posted one picture. I follow one person, this organization. And that's it. And, and I don't, I mean, I'm still human. Sometimes I go and I'm a voyeur and I look, but then I re right away catch myself. And I'm like, you know what? I'm susceptible to things. So let me get that out of my vision. Um, I shut down my personal Facebook years ago and I was like, you know what? It's not because I'm better than anybody else. It's because I know I'm human and I know my weaknesses and recognize those weaknesses and know that the most important for, thing for me is to express myself within music. So I don't need to pay attention to all those things. Yes, I fall victim sometimes, but not paying attention has put me in such a better headspace and allowed me to focus on that and not listen to the echoes out there and just pursue my vision and do it. Dasha, do you do the same thing? Yeah, sort of. I mean, you create your own filter, you know, and, but, you know, you can't 
you know, be like everything you say, whatever, verbally or artistically or something, you know, there are so many opinions, so many different people, you know, you can't, it's okay to have a bad review and it's okay. And, you know, you can approach this review as a critic and as constructive creative or just skip it or, you know, create your own filter for it. Of course, sometimes you get affected. Someone, you, say, well, you know, like I had a moment where someone, I post something that I love and there was a comment, this is shit. I'm like, hmm, maybe you're right. But, you know, like it's not, um, it's not fundamental because if you still believe, as Zach says, believe in your what you want to say, and if it's you, and you're sincere and genuine, you still think, okay, well, you know, some people might like it, some people might not understand, some people, I don't know. And also, you know, it, it happens through the time where, you know, I had someone that I trusted criticize, let's say, one of the release, like, oh, what did you do with this? Why, why, why did you release this? And then 10 years later, she's like, it was genius. I didn't understand that time. So everything can change and also be affected by all the opinions. It's just going to get lost. You know, if you want to say something, just say it. And, you know, you can have also like in a dialogue, you, you can have an argument with someone, someone might not agree or not like what you say. It's the same with artistic path. So you can't really uh, avoid negative opinions. You just have to live with it and it's fine. Stingray, I think you have an interesting case here because like, you know, electro has been a hot sound for like the last few years, but you were doing it, well, I don't know, 10, 15 years, like when it wasn't like the hot or trendy thing. What made you like stay on that musical path? Did you just really believe in like the music you were making and that's what you wanted to do? You know, um, I had a lot of conversations. I have to give a lot of credit to uh, Gerald Donald because he helped me to kind of focus, you know what I mean? Because he was always pushing for, you know, uh, an eclectic sound. He was always focused on sound design. And so I, it kind of got me focused as well on that. And I felt like the, the, the tracks that I was DJing and selecting were uh, the, the best tool for me to express my vision which is you know you know i dig uh to to put it kind of uh casually you know i dig science and technology and medicine and i feel like this music reflects it the best this style that i do and um yeah so i mean um yeah i just i just felt like this was built for me even back when i was djing and the uh the style was built for me even back when i was djing at the uh the motorcycle club and you know they liked you know back then that was, it was tupac and it was uh luke's luke skywalker and you know the booty music and you know i really didn't play a lot of it i was playing more of the you know uh you know technicolor and you know whatever more uh technical sounding record so and i still have that kind of style today you'll rarely hear me playing anything you know talking about booty and stuff like that you know so yeah i just feel like you know i mean it just it just speaks to me the style speaks to me you know that's about the best way i can put it josie did you ever have any moments of doubt with your djing um yeah i'm like i can see the security is coming to chuck me off and i should play the last tune and I'm just not going to make this my last tune. I'm going to keep playing forever and you're going to have to drag me off these decks and I'll fight you. I'll fight you to the death. <laughs> That's like the most stressful. <laughs> but um, I think one point I do want to make actually is about like, we've I've spoken about like social media a lot and, and I think I definitely, in terms of your point about knowing what works for you, because I think for me, like for example, quitting Instagram again, as you've said to echo what you said, it wasn't like, oh, I'm better than Instagram. It was like, to me, I found it quite a, a toxic place, but then the, the platform that I do like Twitter. Some people find that toxic and it's just about what you know is not going to like affect you and make you feel sad and make you kind of question things. And I think because DJing in particular is like so highly competitive. I mean, it's so, so, so competitive. So of course, if you're following a lot of these people and you're uh, these people, well, like I'm not one of them, if you're following these people, <laughs> if you're following like a lot of DJs and, um, it's so easy. You could have the highest self-esteem in the world. Of course, you're going to find yourself looking at what other people are doing. And actually, uh, if there's platforms that are making you feel like shit about yourself, then yeah, that's a, that's a thing you need to look at for yourself. But actually, then maybe don't be on that platform so much. But at the same time, 
there's also incredible stuff happening on these platforms. And I think that's why I've stuck with Twitter because like I said, I've seen like social movements happening, not just within music, but across the world. And it's incredibly inspiring. And I think it's changed me as a person, especially over the last couple of years. There's so many people that are doing so many incredible things. And I mean, this panel is about your artistic voice. There's so many people that have traditionally never had a voice. And actually these platforms have given them a chance to, to have their to have their say at last and maybe not in, not still not even as much as they should do and i think that to me is like the the power of it and i think it goes back to kind of integrity and your message and all this kind of stuff and um it, it's just finding what works for you and try not to get dragged into doing things because you're expected to do this you're expected to do that uh, i mean like for example every summer I hear DJs, some DJs that I really respect saying, oh, I'm just doing like festival sets at the moment. And you're like, what, what does that mean? And they're like, basically what it comes down to is they're playing music they don't like because it's a festival because they're just trying to get a certain reaction. It's just like, that's like so sad. It's like really awful. But it's like people, I thought people genuinely feel like there's a pressure to do that. Whereas actually what would happen if you just played the tunes that you love? Like what are you, what are you so afraid of? And I think it's just being bold and courageous and, and using your voice, your, the voice that you've cultivated. And again, that's like we said, if knowing where you work and where you fit, I mean, if I can't hate on somebody, if they're like, look, I want to be a festival DJ and I just want to play these big tunes. Great. I know I don't. And so I would rather be in environments. And then you have to, again, as an artist, make the decisions and stay with and be willing to risk some popularity, maybe some money and some things to hold on to your integrity. Because in the end, again, you can't hide bullshit. So either you're going to be genuinely happy playing the music you love or you're not. And it's going to be really obvious at some point. There's been a lot of mentions of social media today, but there's another aspect of, the, of being an artist that I wanted to ask about, and that's dealing with the press, you know, people like me. Um, you know, so I know we're the worst. Um, I, most of us actually are the worst. Um, but, um, you know, part of spreading your own artistic voice relies on people like me writing about your music or interviewing you and then writing an article about it or, you know, whatever it may be. How do you engage with the press and make it constructive for you? And not necessarily even in a careerist sense, but just, you know, being happy with the results or not having it or more not being sad or upset by the result is probably the most important bit. Um. You first. Okay, well, I didn't engage with the press for a really long time, actually. <laughs> I mean, I was not, I mean, yeah, I had a few interactions, but I was not a really a press person. Um, yeah, recently, I mean, as part of the game, maybe a little bit more involved, but with no offense, um, you know, press, I mean, uh, to a certain degree, yeah, it plays an important role, you know, the rev reviews and stuff, but actually, you know, if the record is good, it's good. It doesn't matter if it's reviewed or not somehow it will make its own way you know you know what i mean i agree you're not so, gonna offend me like yeah no, 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 you said, <laughs> go okay. for it it was a more <laughs> ironic kind of um and so i mean press is important but what i want to say because we had this interesting conversation yesterday where um it's actually really hard for press now because music journalists and that's what i want to mention so basically um People who write uh, reviews and music, they're not really well paid, right? And, um, you know, so they can't spend all their time doing this. They have to do something else and or something. So um, there is really not much involvement in, involve, involvement yeah. in it. So it's, 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 it's actually hard. So basically, or you get a very young people who wants to make just pocket money and just write reviews and stuff. So there is- Or build like, their own name even. Yeah, or, but so music journalism, I think is struggling a little bit too, because you know, there is no platform. It's, it's becoming a little bit obsolete because people just comment, you know, it's, it's like inter different interaction. So um, yeah, it's, it's hard, but as an artist, how do I relate to press? I mean, I think press is important, but I think less is more maybe also. And, you know, in terms of, you know, interaction between artists and press and also somehow like we all interdependent on each other somehow, you know, if there is no material to review, there is no press, you know what I mean? So, but yeah, we, you know, but it's not the only factor that makes 
you know, uh, people to know about something, you know, what I mean, like if the record is good, it will reach out somehow the people or, you know, so I, I mean, it's important, but it's not, you know, you have to like find the right balance between where you put things out and give people to review or just go your own way. Even, you know, your own Instagram, just here's my new record. And sometimes it doesn't need a review and, you know, I mean, I, I think also with press, I mean, I can only give my own instance about this. Yeah. Like at the beginning, of course, I got hit by, you know, let's say my first record came out and I got hit by various channels and I didn't have anyone really helping me. So I tried to answer everyone yeah. and I tried to kind of facilitate everyone's questions. And then I got really lucky and I met a, a guy who helps work with me, Sebastian. And, you know, with Sebastian, I had a filter and we talked. And again, just like having the team around you of people who believe in your concept and vision, where my agent works with me on one side, Sebastian helps me because he filters press requests and things. And he also knows that I have this belief in less is more. And then when I do talk, I want it so you can go back to my interviews in five years and see something that I said that is still hopefully relevant and I don't overdo it. And I try not to repeat myself too often, except for certain subjects. And, um, it's, uh, I mean, yeah, press, I think can be done really well. And I think when you're given the opportunity to speak about topics, you believe in music, you believe in your processes that you believe in. It's interesting. But if I ever get hit up with what's your top five, fuck off. I don't, I don't even want to answer it. I mean, and I'm because it's a waste of space at that point. I mean, yeah, I could tell you, but I would rather tell you something a little deeper. I'd rather have a deeper talk at that point. Yeah. Um, I, I'm because I don't kind of have a product apart from like DJ sets. So I don't really have, um, there's not really that much being, I'll get the violins out. There's not much being written about me. Uh, no, apart from like maybe reviews of my like um, kind of sets and things like that. But do you don't get an interview like requests? I do. I do get a few, but yeah, I don't really, I don't really do that many. And it's, yeah, sometimes you just think like, what am I trying, what am I trying to sell? Like, what am I trying to get out of this? You know, like I, I actually, I mean, some of it might just be down to that. I don't think that I've got anything that that's, that's that interesting to say because I genuinely, again, get the violins out. I genuinely feel like because I DJ and I'm playing other people's music, I actually really don't think that like myself as a character is anything like that. That's interesting. And don't get me wrong. I do understand the skill of DJing. And I know that there might be sets that I play that people have had a great night and everything. I'm not putting any of that down, but actually for me, I don't really feel like there's that much that's of interest that needs to be kind of written about because I don't really have like a product that I'm trying to push or anything. So every now and again, I might do something, but most of the time I won't, I'm just like, just come and hear a DJ set or listen to my radio show. And I feel like that says everything that I want to say. Stingray, I feel like I don't see a lot of interviews with your name on them. Yeah, <clears throat> I try to be very uh, selective with the interviews that I do. And like Zach said, with the content, and I want somebody to be able to read my my interview five, six, whatever years, years from now and be like, yeah, that was a good interview. I got something out of it. I try to be helpful uh, to younger artists or, you know, artists that are out there on the fringe. I just try to give good, healthy content, something you can just grasp and take with you. And I am selective about it. The press is a necessary evil. I mean, coming out of Detroit, do you feel like that's something that you like came up with? I mean, it seems like all of the biggest Detroit guys forever yeah. have always been pretty cagey about the press. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely an aesthetic that I learned in Detroit and at, at the record store that I worked at. You know, it's like, you know, you have these in the city, of course, any city, you have these little camps and, you know, these cliques. And so. You know, the best policy is, you know, to keep your mouth closed and your eyes open. So uh, that's a policy I try to keep with today. So gangster. <laughs> <laughs> I want to shift gears a little bit. Um, all of you are very busy. We talked about this before. Uh, and how do you stay excited about making art or DJing <laughs> when you're just exhausted? sometimes or when you're running around like how do you find inspiration when you just want to like take a nap or watch netflix or whatever it may be 
Well, I mean, I said before, you don't sleep. But it's just, it's just, no, I mean, it's, 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 it's hard to describe how those moments come and how you can concentrate or find ideas or think about ideas. It comes so naturally. It can happen anywhere. You know, you can see it on the airplane, just like in this metal tube up there and bam, you know, you have some, oh, I don't know, before going to bed or you sit there and pick nose, well, you don't sit there, pick nose, but you run to the <laughs> airplane through the airport and pick nose and then something comes. So it can be anything. I don't know. Like it's, it's hard to define, you know, how, uh, like for me, there's I mean, no precise moment or it's just the whole. I mean, I've had, I've, I've brought like some uh, resident DJs and friends from my hometown in Minneapolis, specifically one on the road with me a couple times. And I remember the first time I brought him to play with me in Panorama Bar and we were playing in Amsterdam the night before and we were going to have no sleep. And he looked at me, he's like, I don't know how we're going to do it. And I was like, you don't have a choice. You just will. You love what you do. Trust me, you'll be fine. Have a coffee. Don't drink any alcohol. You'll be fine. And the reality is, as we got there, I was the one who was like, I want to go home. And he's like, let's stay. Let's stay. You know, and because you just ultimately you have you, you, you agreed to do this. You love what you do. You showed up. You got on the plane. You're not napped for 30 minutes. You passed out in the hotel for 30 minutes. You're exhausted. Gig starting in 30. You get there. Hopefully the monitors are great. Sounds good. Crowd's good. You turn up the volume and you're like, yep, I'm good. Let's go. And you, it, it re-energizes you. I mean, again, we're really lucky in that sense. It re-energizes you that moment you walk in and hear that loud music and that pressure and you feel the heat of the room and the people's energy. It brings you back into that moment. But seriously. You know, for me, oh, sorry. <laughs> you know, my attitude is each gig I played is next to the last one. You only got a finite amount. And so, you know, sometimes I'm tired. But then when I, you know, I go to the club, I'm walking through the crowd, you know, I'm getting dapped people, you know, you know, showing love. And then, you know, you get behind the decks and you energize and you just ready to go and put it down because, you know, you're, you're lucky to do it. You're lucky to do it. So you should go in with an attitude of appreciation and giving your best to the people yeah. and don't cry. <laughs> no, I mean, it's also a sense of responsibility in the moment you get to the stage, you actually forget about your own troubles and being sick or being tired, it's, you know, because you love that, but be also a sense of, I guess, responsibility of, as a performer, like, you know, you just give full on and, and it's, you know, you it's release for it's me. Like yeah. I mean, DJing yeah. is a yeah. release for me. Yeah. Like as much as I, I, I'm lucky to like, again, to have it be my career and my passion, but it's also a release. Somebody was like, do you go to therapy? I'm like, no, I DJ mm. for hours mm. and I get everything out. And it's, so again, it's, it's needed. I, yeah. I need it. And yeah. so it's become part of my life. It's embedded. I've been doing it for almost 25 years now. So it's more than half my life that I'm exhausted and playing music loud and digging for it and being energized by it. And it just becomes like a third, you know, it becomes your arm. It becomes your leg. It's part of you, I think, at this, at least for us at that stage. Josie, are you ever running low on energy? Um, I think, I do think sleep is really important. I think, especially if you're doing like loads of gigs back to back. I mean, I love sleeping anyway, so I'm always going to prioritize that. But like when, if a schedule comes through and I'm doing like loads and loads of things, I will like make my own alternative like sleep schedule because sometimes it is that you're just like grabbing two min two minutes, two hours here, like four hours here. And actually it all adds up and that can lead to like health problems. I think that can also impact like mental health issues as well. And I'm not, I, I kind of don't really drink that much. I don't really take anything. So anything. Uh, so, um, <laughs> um, so I have to kind of just look after myself and stuff, but I definitely agree that in terms of energy, I think the difference between doing things that you don't love and you do love is that the things that you don't love take energy away from you and the things that you love give you energy. And I feel like this sounds like so melodramatic, but definitely over the last like kind of five years, I've had like a lot of turbulence in like my, my family and like bereavements and stuff. And honestly, I can say hand on heart that like, DJing has actually stopped me from going under. It actually feels that way. In especially in those times when something terrible has happened and quite recently, I might cancel a few gigs and then I get back into it. And that's the thing that like pulls me up from the brink. And it really, really has saved me. Radio, when I first started doing radio, I was it was um I was on Rinse FM at like three o'clock in, in the morning on a Thursday night. Um 
and I had like work the next day and I remember someone in my someone very close to my fa- to me and my family died and I just kept doing my rent show I didn't talk I just went there and I just didn't talk I just went into the studio and I just played music for two hours really loud and like to me that was again like therapy that was really important and again over the last couple of years I've had very similar situations so it's got to a point now where I realize how important it is to me and I think coming from the background I have where you're a bit cool with things and it's like oh everyone's a DJ like in my family and we all love music and you kind of um you don't really admit to yourself how important it is to you because you just think this is just part of me it's something I do and it's a cool thing or whatever and actually I've realized how much it has done for me and how much I need it and that's been a kind of a vulnerable thing for me it's put me in a vulnerable position because it's made me realize how much I do need it as well and um yeah it definitely has saved me and I think in terms of mental health which is a big discussion I think doing things that you love gives you that energy which means that you can kind of it gives you the strength to get through bad moments in life hopefully and Josie said I just want to add one more thing was it's about taking care of yourself and kind of knowing your balance like if I know I'm not going to get, I mean, I already also, I don't drink, so I just drink water at gigs, but I take care of myself in the last four or five years, as I started to cross and got closer to 40 and then over 40, my knees started to hurt. You know, I need, I started to take, eat healthier, do a little stretching, just little things to counterbalance the crazy and insane lifestyle that I lived in my twenties. I could play three all night sets in a row and be like, yeah, I'm good and no problem, but I'm now 43. And if I want to keep doing what I love, I have to take care of it and you know, manipulate a little bit of things in my life in terms of taking care of myself so I can keep doing what I love as long as possible. I want to ask, this is more of a stylistic question, but all of you, you know, initially got notoriety doing a certain thing. Like you're known for, you know, Stingray does this, DVS1 does this. So now as your, you know, career has continued on, how important is it for any of you to be open to new sounds, new trends, and how willing are you to let yourself evolve musically? And if you are evolving, or do you ever worry about like, oh no, I'm going to lose, you know, what defined me as an artist and that might affect my career. And like, how do you balance all of that stuff? Go Josh. I don't have a precise formula for it uh, somehow, but um, for me, I think personally, it's very kind of interesting to set challenges to myself, like try new things. I mean, I'm interested in technology, I'm interested in music, but it's not only a musical aspect. Um, I don't know, personally, I, I do, I would do, you know, audiovisual project or work with a dancer, something that I always add to the music like a kind of collaborative processes or something. So it's it's just set a new challenge or try something new. But new, I'm not saying about like globally new, but just new to myself, to to my um, you know personal creative process. So I mean, I don't know. <laughs> well, for me, I feel like you know, okay, I'm in the field, like I'm doing electro, right? I'm known for that, right? You know, I've done other stuff, but I feel like there's enough room in what I'm doing to push it forward, sound design, rhythm. You're still kind of, so to speak, in the same box, but I think there, this box is so huge, it's enough room for you to evolve within that. Now, if you happen to go into another field, that's cool, but do we ask that when we, when we say, uh, let's say we have a jazz musician, do we say, okay, are you going to evolve out of jazz or uh, the rock and roller? Does he or she revolve out of rock and roll? No, you know, you perfect yourself in your craft, in your field. And I feel like, you know, in what I'm doing, I don't really feel boxed in. I feel like I can add new dimensions or I can help add new dimensions to it, push it forward, refine it perfect it or attempt to perfect it that's how i look at it so this way i don't fall into the trap of okay you know you've seen artists where they were doing one thing and then they do this i don't know an ambient album a, a album or something just totally out of their box and then they they lose their momentum then they try to come back to it and you know time has moved on so rather than do that again i would just rather kind of try to perfect what box I'm in now. I'm happy being in a box. 
Well, I want to ask you like a specific question though, just because like, you know, like you said, I think most people know you as Electro, but I've seen you DJ in recent years and you'll drop like a dubstep record or like the first time you did that, was that like, were you nervous about it? Was it like, you know, cause that felt like when I, when I remember seeing it, I was like, DJ Stingray's playing a dubstep record right now. Like, is this happening? And uh, so for you in the DJ booth. Well, it goes back to, uh, what everybody was saying about playing what you like, because we all we all are out here playing what we like. No compromises. So, you know, I heard those tracks, you know, I, I was hearing a lot of grime stuff on um, rents, you know, when the, when the MCs were, you know, they just freestyle. So, I, I, you know, and I picked up a lot of tracks off of that. And I was like, yeah, I could play this because it's like the tracks were like at 75 BPM and I'm playing 150. I'm like, hey, I can fit this in toward the end. So that's how that kind of, you know, uh, I've always liked, uh, you know, hip hop, you know, R&B and all that kind of stuff. So it was just kind of a convenient way for me to change it up and fit it in. I'd like to see one day where cats are doing um you know, so-called electro at 75, 80, you know, that would be interesting. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to echo even what he said is, yeah, like, uh, you know, you're, it's like being a doctor or going into something, you know, and gaining your knowledge and wisdom and accreditation towards what you do and get better at it. Like, uh, I know Dasha does a lot of different things. I where, mean, it's still related to sound. No, no, of I course. Yeah, they're all related to sound. No, no, exactly. But like, let's say where I can parallel with stingray on this i'm trying I'm, I'm chasing kind of my doctorate in rhythmic djing like that's where i'm that's where i'm chasing but my influences come from so many things you know my influences come from what i grew up on breakdance music hip-hop disco so like when i go play a house set and kids are like but you're a techno dj no i love music you know, I'm, I chase rhythm and, and I can find that in various forms and I hear rhythm in weird places and interesting things, but my influence spreads far outside of what I'm known as, as a DJ. And the reason why people I think like our styles is because of our various influences actually outside of what we're known for. Like the reason why I play techno that has that rhythm and bass and undertone is from the other genres of music and things that influence me that I hear and bring back into techno. Josie, I feel like you play so many different styles that may it's a little easier for you to yeah. like stretch your stretch your legs creatively, but yeah, how I do you approach I think probably yeah, that's maybe what I'm known for in terms of just playing just going anywhere with it. And I think yeah, that makes it easy for me because then um, it gives me that freedom to I mean I'll most of the times I turn I'll walk up into the booth and I literally have no idea what I'm going to play. And t sometimes I will stand there and I think I know what I'm going to play. And then the DJ will play a last tune and I'll be like, oh no, I'm going to play something. That's that kind of vibe. And I think for me, a lot, I do get asked quite a lot. Oh, how did you go from like jazz to electric? Wow. I sound like I'm really showing off about myself. How did you go from <laughs> jazz to electro to grime? Uh, so smoothly and beautifully. People always ask me that, don't they? Uh, but, um, to me, it goes back to the point about your influences. And I've always said, I think I'll be terrible working in a, in a record shop because I'm so bad at like genre. I'd be putting like all the techno in the like house section and the electro in the grime section. Because like to me, when I'm playing a tune, it's a, it's about spirit and an energy. And I think that's the thing with like grime. I feel like grime has got so much in common with electro because it's that spirit that energy and it's also about like the kind of kids that were making this music as well when it was like came out it's there's so much similarity in it and I think to me for me like when I'm playing a set it's about keeping the energy level at a certain point and actually that could be from like some sick jazz tune going into like something that's just like pure drums or whatever that's the same energy to me and and that's what I'm I'm kind of going for but yeah I am lucky and that I can just the whole world is my oyster, but also unlucky because then it just means that I just spend like twenty thousand pounds every day on discogs. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're running low on time, so I want to go ahead and throw it to the audience. Does anyone out there have any questions? Yeah, you over there.
I mean, you mentioned specifically like organizing this panel. So putting together this whole day of panels even, to me, this is an extension of my artistic voice, actually. It just isn't through me DJing, but it's actually through my philosophies, ideas, concepts, inviting these people to share a stage, everyone who spoke all day today. And it's part of the long game. I'm not looking for short-term results. Like I've been doing this so long that everything I do is unconsciously part of my long game. I'm not in this trying to get the biggest booking tomorrow or the next article written up about whatever. Like even the subjects that we talked about today outside of even this one and even this one is in the longevity. It's, it's in the long game. So I think it's okay and I'm fine time to do it because it, it's just as important for me in my voice as I do when I DJ. Yeah. Anyone else have any unique interests that feed into your music? No, no one else likes anything. <laughs> Nothing to add really. <laughs> yeah, I kind of lost track of the question. What, can oh, you, yeah. what was it again? Do you have any interests outside of music that still feed into your art and how do you make time for them? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Sports. You know, watching sports pretty much is how I spend my time. Sports, science, documentaries, stuff like that. So I guess it kind of meshes. You know what I mean? So and then besides just life, you know, life is a distraction. You know, you can't always be behind the workstation or the deck. So, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I just, no, I don't really have anything uh, that uh, really distracts me. It's outside of the normal flow of life, really. You know what I mean? I just schedule time in the studio. Ske I mean, well, behind the uh, workstation, schedule time in the decks, and then just let life kind of flow around that, you know? I hope that makes sense. Um, I wanted to actually congratulate you. Wow, why, why have I become the moderator? Sorry about that. I wanted to congratulate you. <laughs> uh, like today's been like so amazing, and I think it's like the fact that it's all independent. And I think something that I think about a lot increasingly is like giving back and like what more can I do? And it's not something that I've always thought about, but recently, I think more and more recently, I'm thinking about what can I do. Especially like I've said with some of the the movements that I'm seeing on on social media and in the clubs that I get to travel to, and I think that's another thing. I'm like I'm really I feel really blessed with some of the clubs that I play around the world because it's people really like minded people with like values that I re that I really have a lot in common with, and it makes me when I come back home to London think I want to be doing more and whether that's workshops not even necessarily so much like kind of DJing workshops but even just bringing people together to have conversations about and some something like just like fees things like that how do you negotiate how do you make sure that uh you're kind of staying on the path that you want to stay with because when you're when you're starting out for example it, and you might be really excited and wanting to play everywhere. Actually, then there's a point where you're like, oh, I need to, I, this is the direction I want to go in. And it's, and it's, you might be pulled about from kind of from here to there. So something I'm, I, I want to set up like more kind of networking events and things like that. But, um, Write again, down all your ideas. Like, we'll maybe do them next time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, like my first event's going to be called like finding your artistic voice with like DJ Stingray and like, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but, I think I think there's always more that you can do as well, probably as well. And yeah, something I'm thinking about a lot. Yeah. All right. Um, maybe we have time for one last question. Did was there was another one? I mean, I think for me, it was just as easy as, like I said, about the example of being influenced by what you read or what you saw everyone else like. And maybe you even kind of, because we're human, like went a little bit that direction. I put my foot in the pool and I was like, nah, not interested. Don't want to go. But I tried it. Sure. And at least by trying it, I also know it's not for me. But if I hadn't tried it, would I have wondered about it that I should go that direction or if it existed? I mean, we're, we're, we're put with forks in our life at so many points and you either go left or you go right. And sometimes maybe you go right and you feel like you can't go backwards to go left again, but you can, you can always keep changing and keep evolving and keep moving. And I just think being honest with yourself, 
trying a little bit, maybe stepping into your uncomfortable spaces sometimes and beyond your comfort zone, and then being honest with yourself. Like, can I do that? Is it for me? Am I interested? Am I okay with it? And if you are, cool. If you're not, back up two steps, go the other way. Yeah. Uh, there's something I want to add about actually concerning learning process. You mentioned learning process, but you, learning, you mentioned more like learning from your mistakes or yeah. something. But there is also an important part, which I find really important, is learning new things, like, you know, via technology or new synthesizer or like not always stuck. It actually, you know, make you progress in artistically and, you know, technically, obviously, but like learning finding the time to learn something new technology or some you know theoretical wise or practical wise but it's like a very important discipline that i think you know you have to find time for it as well i mean it's a different aspect of learning but i just yeah yeah because you know because it, it makes you develop it makes you it brings you new ideas as well you can you know you can get inspired even from learning a new tool just you know to, or you know reading a new article about theory music or something you know in general like a, not in in every yeah it doesn't have to be always music related just like learning process not always stuck in the same thing i think yeah i think yeah yeah well yeah or oh, even I was more kind of talking about more focused learning that where you actually, uh, you know, expand your knowledge generally. It's it's very important and I'm not just kind of stuck on one. Yeah. And, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, it's okay. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have, but this has been a really great panel. Let's hear it for Dasha Rush, Josie Rubel, DVS1, DJ Stingray. <laughs>